Hey everyone, we're back with another chapter of Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan. We're reading the illustrated copy, which is illustrated by John Rocco. So we are in the end game here. They're in the underworld. There's so much that's happened. Oh my goodness. If you are watching this with someone, pause and talk about or if you are watching it by yourself, pause and think about some of the characters that are in this story that we have run into, some of the places we have been and different monsters we've run into. What is this quest that Percy, Annabeth, and Grover on are all about? And then take a moment, come on back, and here goes my quick review. Percy Jackson is our main character. We first see him on a field trip for his school. He gets in trouble with a teacher named Mrs. Dodds. Turns out Mrs. Dodds is a scary monster. She grows wings, she has fangs, she has talons, glowing eyes, and she attacks Percy. His other teacher, Mr. Brunner, tosses him a sword and Percy cuts through her. So he survives Mrs. Dodds and the rest of the school year. Then he and his best friend Grover head back to New York City where Percy lives. Percy sees his mom again. Her name is Sally Jackson and she is awesome. She loves Percy so much and is a really nice lady. She is married to a not nice guy named Gabe. He is called Smelly Gabe. Smelly on the inside and the outside. Not a nice guy. Well, Sally and Percy go on a little vacation and there they see Grover who warns them that they are in grave danger. Also, he's a satyr, which means he has goat legs, little horns coming out of his hair. Grover, Percy's mom, and Percy all drive as fast as they can to Camp Half-Blood. Problem is, they get stopped by the Minotaur, a terrifying, huge monster with a bull's head and it's hard to stop. He grabs Percy's mom and she explodes in gold dust, disappears. We have no idea where she went. Percy defeats the Minotaur, and then he and Grover make it over the line to Camp Half-Blood. In Camp Half-Blood, we meet the director, Dionysus, who is the god of wine, and Mr. Brunner, who is Percy's old teacher, is there too. His name is actually Kyrian, and he has been teaching different heroes for thousands of years. Percy meets a couple friends, Annabeth, who is in the Athena cabin, and Luke, who is in the Hermes cabin. He meets a not-so-friend named Clarice in the Ares cabin. They are all in these cabins because Camp Half-Blood is for kids who have one mortal parent, or regular human, and one parent who is a Greek god. They then live in the cabin that goes with their parent. Percy doesn't know who his parent is yet, so he stays with the guys in Hermes. They play capture the flag. At the end of the game, Percy is revealed to be the son of the sea god, Poseidon. Percy, Annabeth, and Grover go on a quest. Turns out, Zeus's master bolt has been stolen. It's his biggest, scariest weapon. Zeus thinks his brother Poseidon stole it, but Poseidon doesn't have it, so he thinks Hades, the lord of the underworld, their other brother, stole it. Percy and his two friends, Annabeth and Grover, have to go on a quest to the underworld where Hades lives and try to get it back. Well, on their quest, they run into lots of things. They run into the Furies, which is Mrs. Dodds and her two sisters, very scary monsters, and they explode a bus. They run into Medusa, who just looking at her in the eyes turns you to stone. They run into a Chimera, which is a giant lion that breathes fire and has a snake tail. It's scary. It blows a hole in the side of the St. Louis Arch. Whew. They meet Ares, the god of war, and he sends them on a little quest. They get stuck in a casino that time doesn't mean anything. They were only there for a couple hours. It was five days. Whew. Then they finally make it to Los Angeles, Santa Monica Bay, Poseidon sends someone to give Percy a gift of three pearls, and Percy is supposed to use those in dire need. Finally, they make it, and they are in the underworld. They kind of paid off the guy who 
runs the ferry, carry on, <laughs> and told him they would tell Hades that he wants a race. Hmm. Well, they almost get eaten by a three-headed dog named Cerebus, who guards the gates of Hades in the underworld. But Annabeth has a giant rubber ball and plays fetch with him, and so she makes a friend of a giant dog. They barely sneak through and are in the underworld. So let's see exactly what happens next in Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. Chapter 19. We find out the truth. Mm, sort of. Imagine the largest concert crowd you've ever seen. A football field packed with a million fans. Now imagine a field a million times that big, packed with people, and imagine the electricity has gone out. There's no noise, no light, no beach ball bouncing around over the crowd. Something tragic has happened backstage. Whispering masses of people are just milling around in the shadows, waiting for a concert that will never start. If you can picture that, you've got a pretty good idea of what the fields of Asphodel look like. The black grass had been trampled by eons of dead feet. A warm, moist wind blew like the breath of a swamp. Black trees, Grover told me they were poplars, grew in clumps here and there. The cavern ceiling was so high above us it might have been a bank of storm clouds, except for the stalactites, which glowed faint gray and looked wickedly pointed. I tried not to imagine they'd fall on us at any moment, but dotted around the field were several that had fallen and impaled themselves into the black grass. I guess the dead didn't have to worry about little hazards like being speared by stalactites the size of booster rockets. Annabeth, Grover, and I tried to blend into the crowd, keeping an eye out for security ghouls. I couldn't help looking for familiar faces among the spirits of Asphodel, but the dead are hard to look at. Their faces shimmer. They look slightly angry or confused. They will come up to you and speak, but their voices sound like chatter, like bats twittering. Once they realize you can't understand them, they frown and move away. The dead aren't scary. They're just sad. We crept along, following the line of new arrivals that snaked from the main gates toward a black tented pavilion with a banner that read, Judgments for Elysium and Eternal Damnation. Welcome, newly deceased. Out of the back of the tent came two much smaller lines. To the left, spirits flanked by security ghouls were marched down a rocky path toward the fields of punishment which glowed and smoked in the distance. A vast, cracked wasteland with rivers of lava and minefields and miles of barbed wire separating the different torture areas. Even from far away, I could see people being chased by hellhounds, burned at the stake, forced to run naked through cactus patches, or listen to opera music. I could just make out a tiny hill with the ant-sized figure of Sisyphus, struggling to move his boulder to the top. And I saw worse tortures, too. Things I don't want to describe. The line coming from the right side of the Judgment Pavilion was much better. This one led down toward a small valley surrounded by walls, a gated community, which seemed to be the only happy part of the underworld. Beyond the security gate were neighborhoods of beautiful houses from every time period in history, Roman villas and medieval castles and Victorian mansions. Silver and gold flowers bloomed out on the lawns. The grass rippled in rainbow colors. I could hear laughter and smell barbecue cooking. Elysium. In the middle of that valley was a glittering blue lake with three small islands like a vacation resort in the Bahamas. The Isles of the Blessed. For people who had chosen to be reborn three times, and three times achieved Elysium. Immediately, I knew that's where I wanted to go when I died. That's what it's all about, Annabeth said, like she was reading my thoughts. That's the place for heroes. But I thought of how few people were in Elysium, how tiny it was compared to the fields of Asphodel, or even the fields of punishment. So few people did good in their lives. It was depressing. We left the Judgment Pavilion and moved deeper into the Asphodel Fields. It got darker, 
The colors faded from our clothes. The crowds of chattering spirits began to thin. After a few miles of walking, we began to hear a familiar screech in the distance. Looming in the horizon was a palace of glittering black obsidian. Above the parapets swirled three dark bat-like creatures, the Furies. I got the feeling that they were waiting for us. I suppose it's too late to turn back, Grover said wistfully. We'll be okay. I tried to sound confident. Maybe we should search some of the other places first, Grover suggested. Like Elysium, for instance? Come on, goat boy. Annabeth grabbed his arm. Grover yelped. His sneakers sprouted wings, and his legs shot forward, pulling them away from Annabeth. He landed a flat on his back in the grass. Grover, Annabeth chided, stop messing around. But I didn't. He yelped again. His shoes were flapping like crazy now. They levitated off the ground and started dragging him away from us. Maya, he yelled, but the magic word seemed to have no effect. Maya already, 911, help! I got over being stunned and made a grab for Grover's hand, but it was too late. He was picking up speed, skidding downhill like a bobsled. We ran after him. Annabeth shouted, untie the shoes! It was a smart idea, but I guess it's not so easy when your shoes are pulling you along feet first at full speed. Grover tried to sit up, but he couldn't get close to the laces. We kept after him, trying to keep in sight as he zipped between the legs of spirits who chattered at him in annoyance. I was sure Grover was going to barrel straight through the gates of Hades' palace, but his shoes veered sharply to the right and dragged him in the opposite direction. The slope got steeper. Grover picked up speed. Annabeth and I had to sprint to keep up. The cavern walls narrowed on either side, and I realized we'd entered some kind of side tunnel. No black grass or trees now, just rock underfoot and the dim light of the stalactites above. Grover! I yelled, my voice echoing. Hold on to something! What? He yelled back. He was grabbing at gravel, but there was nothing big enough to slow him down. The tunnel got darker and colder. The hairs on my arms bristled. It smelled evil down here. It made me think of things I shouldn't even know about. Blood spilled on ancient stone altars, the foul breath of a murderer. Then I saw what was ahead of us, and I stopped dead in my tracks. The tunnel widened into a huge dark cavern, and in the middle was a chasm the size of a city block. Grover was sliding straight toward the edge. Come on, Percy, Annabeth yelled, tugging at my wrist. But that's... I know, she shouted, the place you described in your dream, but Grover's going to fall in if we don't catch him. She was right, of course. Grover's predicament got me moving again. He was yelling, clawing at the ground, but the winged shoes kept dragging him toward the pit. And it didn't look like we could possibly get him in time. What saved him were his hooves. The flying sneakers had always been loose on him. And finally, Grover hit a big rock and the left shoe came flying off. It sped into the darkness, down into the chasm. The right shoe kept tugging him along, but not as fast. Grover was able to slow himself down by grabbing on the big rock and using it like an anchor. He was 10 feet from the edge of the pit when we caught him and hauled him back up the slope. The other winged shoe tugged itself off, circled around us angrily and kicked our heads in protest before flying off into the chasm to join its twin. We all collapsed, exhausted, on the obsidian gravel. My limbs felt like lead. Even my backpack seemed heavier, as if someone had filled it with rocks. Grover was scratched up pretty bad. His hands were bleeding. His eyes had gone slit-pupiled, goat-style, the way they did whenever he was terrified. I don't know how, he panted. I didn't... Wait, I said. Listen. I heard something. A deep whisper in the darkness. Another few seconds, and Annabeth said, Percy, this place... Shh, I said. I stood. The sound was getting louder, muttering, an evil voice from far, far below us, coming from the pit. 
Grover sat up. What? What's that noise? Annabeth heard it now, too. I could see it in her eyes. Tartarus! The entrance to Tartarus! I uncapped Riptide. The bronze sword expanded, gleaming in the darkness, and the evil voice seemed to falter just for a moment before resuming its chant. I could almost make out the words now, ancient, ancient words, older even than that of Greek, as if... Magic, I said. We have to get out of here, Annabeth said. Together, we dragged Grover to his hooves and started back up the tunnel. My legs wouldn't move fast enough. My backpack weighed me down. The voice got louder and angrier behind us, and we broke into a run. Not a moment too soon. A cold blast of wind pulled at our backs, as if the entire pit were inhaling. For a terrifying moment, I lost ground, my feet slipping in the gravel. If we'd been any closer to the edge, we would have been sucked in. We kept struggling forward and finally reached the top of the tunnel, where the cavern widened into the fields of asphodel. The wind died. A wail of outrage echoed from deep in the tunnel. Something was not happy we'd gotten away. What was that? Grover panted when we'd collapsed in the relative safety of a black poplar grove. One of Hades pets? Annabeth and I looked at each other. I could tell she was nursing an idea, probably the same one she'd gotten during the taxi ride to L.A., but she was too scared to share it. That was enough to terrify me. I capped my sword, put the pen back in my pocket. Let's keep going. <sighs> I looked at Grover. Can you walk? He swallowed. Yeah, sure. I never liked those shoes anyway. He tried to sound brave about it, but he was trembling as badly as Annabeth and I were. Whatever was in that pit was nobody's pet. It was unspeakably old and powerful. Even Enchidina hadn't given me that feeling. I was almost relieved to turn my back on that tunnel and head toward the palace of Hades. Almost. The Furies circled the parapets, high in the gloom. The outer walls of the fortress glittered black, and the two-story tall bronze gates stood wide open. Up close, I saw that the engravings on the gates were scenes of death. Some were from modern times, an atomic bomb exploding over a city, a trench filled with gas mask wearing soldiers, a line of African famine victims waiting with empty bowls, but all of them looked as if they'd been etched into bronze thousands of years ago. I wondered if I was looking at prophecies that had come true. Inside the courtyard was the strangest garden I'd ever seen. Multicolored mushrooms, poisonous shrubs, and weird luminous plants grew without sunlight. Precious jewels made up for the lack of flowers. Piles of rubies as big as my fist. Clumps of raw diamonds standing here and there like frozen party guests were Medusa's garden statues. Petrified children, satyrs, and centaurs. All smiling grotesquely. In the center of the garden was an orchard of pomegranate trees their orange blooms neon bright in the dark. The Garden of Persephone, Annabeth said. Keep walking. I understood why she wanted to move on. The tart smell of those pomegranates was almost overwhelming. I had the sudden desire to eat them. But then I remembered the story of Persephone. One bite of underworld food, and she would never be able to leave. I pulled Grover away to keep him from picking a big juicy one. We walked up the steps of the palace between black columns through a black marble portio and into the house of Hades. The entry hall had a polished bronze floor, which seemed to boil in the reflected torchlight. There was no ceiling, just the cavern roof, far above. I guess they never had to worry about rain down here. Every side doorway was guarded by a skeleton in military gear. Some wore Greek armor, some British redcoat uniforms, some camouflaged with tattered American flags on the shoulders. They carried spears or muskets or M16s. None of them bothered us, but their hollow eye sockets followed us as we walked down the hall toward the big set of doors at the opposite end. Two U.S. Marine skeletons guarded the doors. They grinned down at us, rocket-propelled grenade launchers held across their chests. 
You know, Grover mumbled, I bet Hades doesn't have much trouble with door-to-door salesmen. My backpack weighed a ton now. I couldn't figure out why. I wanted to open it, check to see if I had picked up some stray bowling ball somehow, but there wasn't time. Well, guys, I said, I suppose we should knock? A hot wind blew down the corridor, and the doors swung open. The guards stepped aside. I guess that means entrevue, Annabeth said. The room inside looked just like my dream, except this time the throne room of Hades was occupied. He was the third god I'd met, but the first god who really struck me as godlike. He was at least ten feet tall, for one thing, and dressed in black silk robes and a crown of braided gold. His skin was albino white, his hair shoulder length and jet black. He wasn't bulked up like Ares, but he radiated power. He lounged on his throne of fused human bones, looking lithe, graceful, and dangerous as a panther. I immediately felt like he should be giving me the orders. He knew more than I did. He should be my master. Then I told myself to snap out of it. Hades' aura was affecting me, just as Ares had. The Lord of the Dead resembled pictures I'd seen of Adolf Hitler or Napoleon, or the terrorist leaders who directed suicide bombers. Hades had the same intense eyes, the same kind of mesmerizing, evil charisma. You are brave to come here, son of Poseidon, he said in an oily voice. After what you have done to me, very brave indeed. Or perhaps you are simply very foolish. Numbness crept into my joints, tempting me to lie down and just take a little nap at Hades' feet, curl up here and sleep forever. I fought the feeling and stepped forward. I knew what I had to say. (sighs) Lord and uncle, I come with two requests. Hades raised an eyebrow. When he sat forward in his throne, shadowy faces appeared in the folds of his black robes. Faces of torment, as if the garments were stitched out of trapped souls from the fields of punishment, trying to get out. The ADHD part of me wondered, off task, whether the rest of his clothes were made the same way. What horrible things would you have to do in life to get woven into Hades' underwear? Only two requests, Hades said. Arrogant child, as if you have not already taken enough. Speak then. It amuses me not to strike you dead yet. I swallowed. This was going about as well as I'd feared. I glanced at the empty, smaller throne next to Hades. It was shaped like a black flower, gilded with gold. I wished Queen Persephone was here. I recalled something in the myths about how she could calm her husband's moods. But it was summer. Of course, Persephone would be above in the world of light with her mother, the goddess of agriculture, Demeter. Her visits, not the tilt of the planet, created the seasons. Annabeth cleared her throat. Her finger prodded me in the back. Uh, Lord Hades, I said. Look, sir, there can't be a war among the gods. It would be bad. Really bad, Grover added helpfully. Return Zeus's master bolt to me, I said. Please, sir, let me carry it to Olympus. Hades' eyes grew dangerously bright. You dare keep up this pretense after what you have done? I glanced back at my friends. They looked as confused as I was. Um, uncle, I said, you keep saying after what you've done. What exactly have I done? The throne room shook with a tremor so strong they probably felt it upstairs in Los Angeles. Debris fell from the cavern ceiling. Doors burst open all along the halls, and skeletal warriors marched in. Hundreds of them, with every time period and nation in Western civilization. They lined the perimeter of the room, blocking the exits. Hades bellowed. Do you think I want war, godling? I wanted to say, well, these guys don't look like peace activists, but I thought that might be a dangerous answer. Uh, You are the Lord of the Dead, I said carefully. 
A war would expand your kingdom, right? A typical thing for my brothers to say. Do you think I need more subjects? Did you not see the sprawl of the Asphodel fields? Well, have you any idea how much of my kingdom has swollen in this past century alone? How many subdivisions I've had to open? I opened my mouth to respond, but Hades was on a roll now. More security ghouls, he moaned. Traffic problems at the Judgment Pavilion? Double overtime for staff? I used to be a rich god, Percy Jackson. I control all of the precious metals under the earth. But my expenses. Carrion wants a pay raise, I blurted, just remembering the fact. As soon as I had said it, I wished I could sew up my mouth. Don't get me started on Carrion, Hades yelled. He's been impossible ever since he discovered Italian suits. Problems everywhere, and I've got to handle them all personally. The commute time alone from the palace to the gates is enough to drive me insane. And the dead just keep arriving. No, godling. I need no help getting subjects. I did not ask for this war. But you took Zeus's master bolt. Lies! More rumbling. Hades rose from his throne, towering to the height of a football goalpost. Your father may fool Zeus, boy, but I am not so stupid. I see his plan. His plan? You were the thief on the winter solstice, he said. Your father thought to keep you his little secret. He directed you into the throne room on Olympus. You took the master bolt and my helm. Had I not sent my fury to discover you at Yancey Academy, Poseidon might have succeeded in hiding his scheme to start a war. But now you have been forced into the open. You will be exposed as Poseidon's thief, and I will have my helm back. But, Annabeth spoke, I could tell her mind was going a million miles an hour. Lord Hades, your helm of darkness is missing too? Do not play innocent with me, girl. You and the satyr have been helping this hero, coming here to threaten me in Poseidon's name, no doubt, to bring me an ultimatum. Does Poseidon think I can be blackmailed into supporting him? No, I said. Poseidon didn't... I didn't... I have said nothing of the helm's disappearance, Hades snarled. Because I have no illusions that anyone on Olympus would offer me the slightest justice, the slightest help. I can ill afford for word to get out that my most powerful weapon of fear is missing. So I searched for you myself. And when it was clear you were coming to me to deliver your threat, I did not try to stop you. You didn't try to stop us, but return my helm now or I will stop death, Hades threatened. That is my counter-proposal. I will open the earth and have the dead pour back into the world. I will make your lands a nightmare. And you, Percy Jackson, your skeleton will lead my army out of Hades. The skeletal soldiers all took one step forward, making their weapons ready. At this point, I probably should have been terrified, the strange thing was, I felt offended. Nothing gets me angrier than being accused of something I didn't do. I've had a lot of experience with that. You're just as bad as Zeus, I said. You think I stole from you? That's why you sent the Furies after me? Of course, Hades said. And the other monsters? Hades curled his lip. I had nothing to do with them. I wanted no quick death for you. I wanted you brought here before me alive, so you might face every torture in the fields of punishment. Why do you think I let you enter my kingdom so easily? Easily? Return my property. But I don't have your helm. I came for the Master Bolt, which you already possess, Hades shouted. You came here with it, little fool, thinking you could threaten me. But I didn't, 
Open your pack then. A horrible feeling struck me. The weight in my backpack, like a bowling ball. It couldn't be. I slung it off my shoulder and unzipped it. Inside was a two-foot-long metal cylinder, spiked on both ends, humming with energy. Percy, Annabeth said. How? I, I don't understand. I don't know. You heroes are always the same, Hades said. Your pride makes you foolish, thinking you could bring such a weapon before me. I did not ask for Zeus's master bolt, but since it's here, you will yield it to me. I am sure it will make an excellent bargaining tool. And now, my helm, where is it? I was speechless. I had no helm. I had no idea how the master bolt had gotten into my backpack. I wanted to think Hades was pulling some kind of trick. Hades was the bad guy. But suddenly, the world turned sideways. I realized I'd been played with. Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades had been set at each other's throats by someone else. The master bolt had been in the backpack, and I'd gotten the backpack from... Lord Hades, wait, I said. This is all a mistake. A mistake? Hades roared. The skeletons aimed their weapons. From high above, there was a fluttering of leathery wings, and the three furies swooped down to perch on the back of their master's throne. The one with Mrs. Dodd's face grinned at me eagerly and flicked her whip. There is no mistake, Hades said. I know why you have come. I know the real reason you brought the bolt. You came to bargain for her. Hades loosed a ball of gold fire from his palm. It exploded on the steps in front of me. And there was my mother, frozen in a shower of gold, just as she had been at the moment when the minotaur began to squeeze her to death. I couldn't speak. I reached out to touch her, but the light was as hot as a bonfire. Yes, Hades said with satisfaction. I took her. I knew, Percy Jackson, that you would come to bargain with me eventually. Return my helm, and perhaps I will let her go. She is not dead, you know. Not yet. But if you displease me, that will change. I thought about the pearls in my pocket. Maybe they could get me out of this, if I could just get my mom free. Ah, the pearls. Hades said, and my blood froze. Yes, my brother and his little tricks. Bring them forth, Percy Jackson. My hand moved against my will and brought out the pearls. Hmm, only three, Hades said. What a shame. You do realize each only protects a single person? Try to take your mother then, little godling. And which of your friends will you leave behind to spend eternity with me? Go on, choose, or give me the backpack and accept my terms. I looked at Annabeth and Grover. Their faces were grim. We were tricked, I told them. Set up. Yes, but why? Annabeth asked. And the voice in the pit? I don't know yet, I said, but I intend to ask. Decide, boy, Hades yelled. Percy, Grover put his hand on my shoulder. You can't give him the bolt. I know that. Leave me here, he said. Use the third pearl on your mom. No. I'm a satyr, Grover said. We don't have souls like humans do. He can torture me until I die, but he won't get me forever. I'll just be reincarnated as a flower or something. That's the best way. No! Annabeth drew her bronze knife. You two go on. Grover, you have to protect Percy. You have to get your searcher's license and start your quest for Pan. Get his mom out of here. I'll cover for you. I plan to go down fighting. No way! Grover said. I'm staying behind. Think again, goat boy! Annabeth said. Stop it, both of you! I felt like my heart was being ripped in two. They had both been with me through so much. I remembered Grover dive-bombing Medusa in the statue garden and Annabeth saving us from Cerebus. 
We'd survived Hephaestus' Waterland Ride, the St. Louis Arch, the Lotus Casino. I had spent thousands of miles worried that I'd be betrayed by a friend, but these friends would never do that. They had done nothing but save me, over and over, and now they wanted to sacrifice their lives for my mom. I know what to do, I said. Take these. I handed them each a pearl. Annabeth said, but Percy... I turned and faced my mother. I desperately wanted to sacrifice myself to use the last pearl on her, but I knew what she would say. She would never allow it. I had to get the bolt back to Olympus and tell Zeus the truth. I had to stop the war. She would never forgive me if I saved her instead. I thought about the prophecy made at Half-Blood Hill, what seemed like a million years ago. You will fail to save what matters most in the end. I'm sorry, I told her. I'll be back. I'll find a way. The smug look on Hades' face faded. He said, Godling! I'll find your helm, uncle, I told him. I'll return it. Remember about Carrion's pay raise. Do not defy me! And it wouldn't hurt to play with Cerebus once in a while. He likes red rubber balls. Percy Jackson, you will not, I shouted. Now, guys! We smashed the pearls at our feet. For a scary moment, nothing happened. Hades yelled, Destroy them! The army of skeletons rushed forward, swords out, guns clicking to full automatic. The Furies lunged, their whips bursting into flame. Just as the skeletons opened fire, the pearl fragments at my feet exploded with a burst of green light and a gust of fresh sea wind. I was encased in a milky white sphere, which was starting to float off the ground. Annabeth and Grover were right behind me. Spears and bullets sparked harmlessly off the pearl bubbles as we floated up. Hades yelled with such rage, the entire fortress shook, and I knew it was not going to be a peaceful night in L.A. Look up! Grover yelled. We're going to crash! Sure enough, we were racing right toward the stalactites, which I figured would pop our bubbles and skewer us. How do you control these things? Annabeth shouted. I don't think you do, I shouted back. We screamed as the bubbles slammed into the ceiling and... Darkness. Were we dead? No, I could feel the racing sensation. We were going up, right through the solid rock, as easily as an air bubble in water. That was the power of the pearls, I realized. What belongs to the sea will always return to the sea. For a few moments, I couldn't see anything out of the smooth walls of my sphere. Then my pearl broke through the ocean floor. The two other milky spheres, Annabeth and Grover, kept pace with me as we soared upward through the water. And kerblam! We exploded onto the surface in the middle of the Santa Monica Bay, knocking a surfer off his board with an indignant, Dude! I grabbed Grover and hauled him over to a life buoy. I caught Annabeth and dragged her over, too. A curious shark was circling us, a great white about 11 feet long. I said, Beat it! The shark turned and raced away. The surfer screamed something about bad mushrooms and paddled away from us as fast as he could. Somehow, I knew what time it was, Early morning, June 21st, the day of the summer solstice. In the distance, Los Angeles was on fire, plumes of smoke rising from neighborhoods all over the city. There had been an earthquake, all right, and it was Hades' fault. He was probably sending an army of the dead after me right now. But at that moment, the underworld wasn't my biggest problem. We had to get to shore. I had to get Zeus's thunderbolt back to Olympus. Most of all, I had to have a serious conversation with the god who tricked me. Well, it sounds like Percy and his friends just barely made it out of there. And they still have a lot of things that they got to figure out before going to Olympus. Let's first look at our map. We have made it completely through our quest here. They have gone to all of the locations over here, and DOA Recording Studios was the last stop to get into the underworld. 
So we just have to make it back to New York City to where Mount Olympus is. Oh boy. And they have to do it by the end of the day. Well, I have another map. This one made me laugh a little. It's called Grover's Extremely Terrifying Map of the Underworld. <laughs> At the bottom, it says, Satyrs can't draw, so I used clip art. Hope this doesn't give anyone nightmares. <laughs> so he used little clip art to make us this map. Over here, you see Cerebus, the dog. They rode down that on the river Styx, the little fairy. They made it into the fields of Asphodel. Over here. That's the Judgment Pavilion, where the bad guys and the good guys go. And here is where they almost got dragged into Tartarus, which is like the underworld for monsters. And there's Hades Palace. They pretty much saw all of the underworld. That's kind of scary. Thanks, Grover, for making us this map. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the things that happened in this chapter. What do the fields of Asphodel look like? So Percy describes them at the beginning of our chapter. Do you remember what they look like? He described it as the most full concert you have ever like seen. So if you've ever seen a video of a ton of people at a concert all crowded together, which is not a good thing right now, is it? Um, but times a million. There's so many people just kind of milling around and walking and just aimlessly shuffling. What do you have to do to enter the Isle of the Blessed? So in this place called Elysium, which is where the good people go in the underworld, according to Greek mythology, the Isle of the Blessed is a special place even inside of it. So according to the Greek myths, they would have to be reincarnated three times. So they would come back as like someone else or an animal or something. And they would have to reach Elysium. So be really good in three lifetimes. Hmm. That's kind of the goal of heroes is what Annabeth said. All right. How do Grover, Percy, and Annabeth end up at the pit of Tartarus? Well... Grover's flying shoes malfunction and Grover gets dragged all the way across and next to the pit. And if he hadn't knocked the shoes off, he would have gotten dragged into the pit. That would not have been good. How does Hades' aura, so what they mean by that is like how he makes other people feel because the Greek gods can like do that to them, I guess. How is his different than Ares? So how does Percy feel different when he's around Hades versus when he's around Ares? So to remember, when Percy met Ares, the god of war, he just wanted to pick a fight with someone. He wanted to punch him. He wanted to just always be angry. But Hades was a little bit different. He could just feel how powerful Hades was, right? He's like, oh, I need to be serving this guy. I need to, I don't know why I'm coming in here and asking for things. He should be asking me things. Luckily, he snapped out of it so that he could ask all the things he needed to do. But, ooh. So what is a little different about the guards of Hades' palace? What do they all look like? skeletons. Yeesh. But the kind of interesting thing is they all had different types of armor. So this one over here is wearing Greek armor and this one over here is wearing red coat like the British in the Revolutionary War. He also said there were kind of more recent ones like people from the US military, you know, maybe within like Korea or something. And they had all different types of weapons. The Greek one had a sword, you know, others had guns. It was, it was weird. Why was Percy's backpack getting heavy? 
Why was it getting heavy? Well, we learn that inside the backpack is Zeus's master bolt. That is what Percy has been looking for this whole time. That's why he's coming to the underworld, right? So he and Annabeth are convinced they have been tricked. Percy didn't steal it. He didn't have it in the backpack before he came into the underworld. Something is up. What terrible choice faces Percy when he decides to use the pearls? So Hades gives him a choice, doesn't he? Let me get that picture of Hades out. He says, you can give me the bolt and leave, or he can take it from them. But if he gives him the bolt, what else did he give Percy? Hades has Percy's mom. But Percy only has how many pearls? How many pearls was he given? Three. But now there's four of them down there. So what was the decision Percy had to make? If he was going to save his friends or his mom? Whew, that's an impossible decision. I would have had a really hard time making that one too. How do Annabeth and Grover prove themselves to be real friends to Percy? Well, first, they've been through all kinds of stuff with them, haven't they? They fought all of those different monsters, got across the entire country, and at the end of it, they're arguing about who is going to stay in the underworld so Percy can take his mom back. Well, he knows how wonderful his mom is too, and she would have never forgiven him for letting the world go to war or leaving his friends down there in the underworld. So he makes a choice of all three of them getting out and he's gonna come back for his mom. Do you think he will? I think he made the impossible task of getting to the underworld in the first place as a 12 year old boy. So I have confidence. And finally, what, I showed the picture before my question, but what is the power of these pearls? What happens? They crack them and then they get floated up in these little bubbles and they splash into the ocean. So they get out of the underworld, luckily, and they have the master bolt. Let's see exactly what happens and if Percy and his friends can get it all the way to New York City by the end of that day. Oh boy, they have quite a predicament ahead of them. Let's see what happens next in our next video. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you guys then. Bye.